Okay, so in the first uh, section uh, discussing transfer learning algorithms, I'm going to talk about forward transfer. Now, outside of the world of reinforcement learning, one of the most popular transfer learning methods today is actually very, very simple. It corresponds to pre-training on one task and then fine-tuning on another task. This is basically the most popular transfer learning method in supervised deep learning. So, as an example, if you were to, if you were interested in doing transfer learning for uh, visual recognition tasks, you might train a large neural network model on ImageNet or MS Coco or something like that. Um, you know, these days you would probably train a ResNet model rather than the model shown here, but same idea. You would train a large model on a large data set, and then you would pull out the convolutional features in that model. So you might remove the last few fully connected layers. And then you would fine tune a new head, a new uh, couple of fully connected layers on top of those features for your new task, like a fine grade classification task. And there are, of course, a few choices to be made here. So you might freeze the uh, features and just train layers on top of those features, or you might fine tune the entire stack end to end. So if you have a very small data set, you might want to keep the features frozen and essentially do something like logistic regression or uh, a one layer MLP on top of the features, or if you have a kind of a medium-sized data set, you might want to fine-tune all the features together with your new fully connected layers. This is a very simple recipe for transfer learning, and it tends to work very, very well, especially if the pre-training data set is very large and very diverse. So could we ap apply an idea like this to uh, the reinforcement learning setting? Can we essentially just train a model on a large uh, previous data set and get it to either transfer to a new setting or fine tune rapidly to a new setting. What issues are we likely to face if we try to do this? Well, so one issue that we might face is the problem of domain shift. Uh, domain shift refers to the setting where there is a systematic difference in the data distribution between the source domain and the target domain. And we've learned already that distributional shift is a really big problem. Um, you know, one example where this often comes up in applications of RL is if you're transferring from two different between two different settings uh, that are distinct in you know primarily perceptual ways, so not not in ways that are functionally relevant, but in ways that are uh, relevant in terms of uh, appearance and other distractors. So this happens, for instance, if you want to transfer a policy for driving a car from a simulated environment to a real one, or maybe from one city to another, or maybe you train driving it in the day and now you want to drive at night. Um, so in these cases, uh, you could pre-train and fine-tune, but it turns out that it can work a little bit better if you do joint training to actually enforce invariance, and we'll discuss that. Um, you might face some issues if there's a difference in, in the MDP. So for example, you might have some things that are possible to do in the, in the source domain, but they're not possible in target domain, right? Um, so in that case, uh, you also need to use a little bit of additional machinery to account for this. Of course, you could just, just pre-train and fine-tune, but in the worst case, you might find yourself having to unlearn the behavior that you learned in the source domain just so that you can relearn it in this different MDP where your capabilities are fundamentally distinct. So, you know, trying to fly like a bird is not a good idea. The way that humans fly is by getting in an airplane, but the control policy for flying the airplane is very different than how the bird moves its wings. And uh, lastly, even if you can do pre-training and fine-tuning, you might get some issues with the fine-tuning process itself. One issue is that the optimal policy in a fully observed MDP is deterministic. And if you end up with a deterministic policy after pre-training, the deterministic policy might not fine-tune effectively in a new MDP simply because it's not exploring enough. And that's an issue that is actually important to mitigate if you want to do pre-training and fine-tuning in RL. Okay, so uh, before I get into RL algorithms, I, I actually want to talk a little bit about how other fields, namely computer vision, have approached some of these issues. And I'll start with the discussion of domain adaptation. So this is that first bullet point, where you have systematic domain shift between the source domain and the target domain. If we just forget about RL for a minute and just imagine that we're learning a visual perception task in this setting, uh, what we might want to do is train that visual perception task in the source domain and have it work in the target domain. One reasonable assumption we might make is that we have access to a small data set in the target domain, but the data set might not be labeled. 
So in RL, this would be the same as having uh, as being able to practice the task with on-policy methods in the source domain, but only having access to a bit of unlabeled data in the target domain. So if you were to train your network in the source domain and then just run it in the target domain, you might find that it produces the correct answer in the source domain, but the wrong answer in the target domain. And just to keep anyone from getting confused, because this often throws me off when I see pictures like this in a paper, I have pictures of two networks here. They're the same network. I'm just visualizing that you, you evaluate that network in the target domain. So the network is trained in the source domain, and then you just run it without any modification in the target domain. Okay, so this is a problem, right? We're going to get the incorrect answer because, in this case, the real images look systematically different than the simulated images. So we need to make some assumption in order to put these things uh, into correspondence because without any assumption, we can't in general guarantee anything. Uh, so an example of something that would be extremely difficult to deal with is if in the target domain, you know, green means stop and red means go, whereas in the source domain, it's the other way around. Now in that case, unless you have some additional information in the target domain, it's very difficult to solve that task. So you have to make some assumption that the differences between the two domains are differences that you can sort of safely ignore. You know, how the trees are rendered, what color the sky is, things like that. And this is the invariance assumption. The invariance assumption basically states that everything that is different between the two domains is irrelevant to the task. And now, is this assumption actually true? It's, it's often not true in practice. But if this assumption is true, then there are very convenient things you can do to deal with domain shift. So if the invariance assumption holds, uh, then you can say the following. P of x, the distribution over the input images, is different between the two domains. That's true. The distribution over real images is different from the distribution of simulated images. However, if invariance holds, that means that there exists some intermediate representation, which I'm going to call z, which is some function of x, where the distribution over the desired output is the same in the two domains, so p of y given z in the source domain is equal to p of y given z in the target domain, but the distribution over z's is also the same in the two domains. So the distribution over x's is different, but the distribution over z's is the same. So for example, if you have this driving scenario, if x represents images, but z represents the positions of the cars, if you have a faithful simulator, you would expect the distribution over the positions to be about the same in the two domains, but the distribution over images would be different. And of course, the relationship between, let's say, the right driving command, given the positions of the cars, is also the same in simulation and in the real world. Uh, now, this is an assumption, uh, but making this assumption uh, gives us a really convenient uh, way to address this domain shift problem by basically discovering this invariant representation. So if we can discover the invariant representation z that has the same distribution in the two domains and that is still sufficient to predict the quantity of interest y, then we'll have solved the domain shift problem. And crucially, you can do this without actually having access to labels in the target domain. So here's how that can work. We're going to pick some layer in our network arbitrarily, but you know one of the fully connected layers would be a good idea, and we'll call that layer z. And then we are going to try to force that layer to be invariant to the domain. So formally what we want to do is ensure that p of z in the source domain is equal to p of z in the target domain. Now that doesn't mean that for any given image it z is the same, it just means that at the population level they're the same. Intuitively what that means is that this layer should not represent anything that is different between the two domains. So if the sky is bright blue in the sim and kind of dark blue in the real world, the color of the sky should not appear in that layer. So how can we do this? Well, if we have paired examples, if someone told us like this state in the sim corresponds to this state uh, in the real world, then we could force the z's to be equal. We could just have like a squared difference loss uh, on those pairs of images. But if we don't have paired examples, then we can still make the z's the same at the population level. So here's how we can do that. We could train another network, which is a binary classifier, and I'm going to call it d phi of z. So phi is the parameter vector for this network. It takes in z, and it outputs a true or false label. And if the label is true, then it's predicting that it's looking at z's for the source domain, and if the label is false, 
but then it's looking at these for the target domain. So it's a binary classifier that tries to guess which domain is it looking at, but only from the z's. Okay, so if this classifier is very good, if it's very accurate, that means that the z's are not invariant. Because if the z's are sufficient to figure out which domain you're looking at, then they must not have the same distribution in the two domains. If they have the same distribution in the two domains, you wouldn't be able to tell just from looking at a vector z which domain you're seeing. So that means that trying to make this classifier inaccurate will make the z's more invariant to domain. So the domain classifier guesses the domain from z, and then we're going to train our network to make this classifier wrong. So what we do is we calculate the gradient through the classifier, we reverse the gradient so we negate it, and then we send this reversed gradient into the network for both real and simulated images. Now again, don't let the arrows confuse you. The common net is the same for real and simulated images. It just gets two different gradients. It gets the gradient of the positive label negated for the simulated images, for the source domain images, and it gets the gradient of the negative label negated for the target domain images. And that basically changes the representation at the layer denoted by z so that it is impossible to guess which domain you're looking at from only seeing that layer. And that will get you an invariant representation. So this is a very powerful idea. It has gone by a number of different names in the literature, including domain confusion and domain adversarial neural networks. OK, so how do we apply this idea in RL? Well, we can apply this idea pretty much directly uh, by literally taking some example observations in the target domain, training up a policy in the source domain, and including this additional loss. So this is a, a paper by Zhang Devon et al., uh, which was kind of one of the first papers to do this in, our, in an RL setting uh, for a robotic manipulation task. And you can see the simulated and real images here are very different. So they're structurally the same. The robot's task is to hang a piece of rope on the grocery scale. The grocery scale is present in both of them, but many of the visual details are completely different. Um, this method actually also incorporates some weak pairwise constraints in addition to this discriminator loss, but the high-level idea is basically the same train the representation so that it is impossible to guess which domain you're looking at. And typically you would do this together with RL. So you would add this loss in addition to the regular uh, reinforcement learning objective to your model. And usually in this setting you would collect on policy data in the source domain, whereas in the target domain you might just have a fixed set of inputs. So you're not actually doing RL on the target domain uh, observations, you're only including them in that uh, classifier loss. Okay. Now, so far, when we talked about this uh, domain adaptation approach, we of course required uh, all of the differences between the two domains to be irrelevant to the task. And that's not, in general, always going to be the case. So, why is invariance not enough when the dynamics of the two MDPs don't match? Well, when the dynamics of the two MDPs don't match, you might actually have different ways of doing the task in one domain as in another domain. Now, in general, this problem is ultimately unsolvable. Like, as I said before, uh, you know, if your source domain is breakout and your target domain is algorithmic trading, you know, ultimately the dynamics might be so different that there's just nothing to transfer. But just because the dynamics don't match doesn't mean that all hope is lost. What you could imagine doing is actually asking the agent to pretend when they're in the source domain that they're actually in the target domain and avoid doing anything that sort of reveals the difference. Let me illustrate this with an example. Let's say that your target domain, shown on the left, has a wall and the robot needs to drive around that wall to reach the goal. Your source domain, shown in the middle, doesn't have this wall, so if you were to just train in the source domain, you would just drive straight to the goal, which of course would not be a viable strategy in the target domain. But perhaps you could have a little bit of data in the target domain and figure out that the wall is present there. And then you could actually modify the reward function in the source domain to tell the agent that they pay a heavy price and reward if they go through the wall. Essentially, you're telling the agent to not shatter the illusion. You say, well, even though you're training in the source domain, pretend as though you're in the target domain and don't do anything illegal. We actually do this all the time. Uh, imagine that you, you needed to practice uh, jumping over 
uh, some some dangerous pit, like maybe you, you're a stuntman and you want to do a jump over a pit with flaming tires or something, right? Whatever it is that stuntmen do, right? Well, you probably wouldn't practice in that setting. You would practice jumping over a shallow, safe pit. And of course, in that source domain, there's a very easy way to do the task. Just ignore the pit, like walk straight through it and get to the target, where you were intentionally pretending as though you're in the target domain just so that you could practice the task. So you're kind of altering your reward function to say, I really don't want to do the thing that I can do in the source domain, but cannot do in the target domain. So we do this all the time. So essentially, you can think of this as kind of telling the agent that they really need to practice the target task, even though they are in the source domain. And then the question becomes, how do we modify the reward to force the agent to act this way? So, you know, the, uh, Ben Eisenbach, who is the, uh, uh, the student who actually uh, came up with a scheme and, and uh, wrote the paper on this, has a really nice example from a, an older film called The Truman Show. So in The Truman Show, uh, the protagonist is in kind of a fake reality, so that they're, they're basically on a, on a movie set. Um, so they're doing a bunch of these things, uh, kind of not realizing that they're not in the real world, uh, until they do something that sort of shatters the illusion, and then and then the, it, it, it's revealed to them that well this isn't this isn't really real. So the idea is avoid taking the actions that will shatter the illusion. So if you want to train the ant robot to walk as far as possible, but you have you have to train in a finite size arena. Then once you get to the edge of the arena, you can look at it and say, well, this doesn't look real to me. You should avoid that. Okay, so how do we modify the reward function to accommodate that? It turns out that you can show that if the reward modification is the difference between the log probability of a transition in the target domain minus its log probability in the source domain, adding this quantity to the reward will actually give you good performance in the target domain. So intuitively, this is saying take transitions that have uh, a high probability of happening in the target domain uh, and uh, don't take transitions that are much less likely in the target domain than they are in the source domain. So if you were to go through the wall, going through the wall has a basically a probability of zero in the target domain, so the first term would be negative infinity, whereas the second term would be uh, finite, would be uh, not, not too low. Now you could train these two dynamics models directly and literally compute this quantity, but if you're training dynamics models, then you might as well do model-based RL. Like if you can train an accurate estimate of p-target, why not just use that? So it turns out that it's actually possible to estimate this quantity by also using a discriminator very much inspired by the domain adaptation approaches that we saw before for invariance. One big difference is that now what you're estimating is the difference of two conditional log probabilities, which means that you actually need two discriminators. So you train one discriminator, which is the orange discriminator, that tries to guess which domain you're in, given STAT and ST plus one, so the entire transition. And then you train a second discriminator, which is the blue one, which just predicts which domain you're in, given just the state and the action. And the reason that you need both discriminators is because just the orange discriminator isn't just discriminating the probability of a transition, it's also looking at the state and action. So you could say, well, this thing looks like the target domain, not because of the transition that happened, but because I don't think you would put yourself in these states uh, in the target domain in the first place. So the second discriminator essentially accounts for that, and then you take the difference of the two discriminators. So you're trying to say, uh, penalize the transitions that are unlikely, don't penalize the SDAT pairs that are unlikely. But if you have these two discriminators together, then you can actually uh, show that that is an unbiased estimate of the log p target minus log p source, and therefore uh, incentivizes the agent to avoid shattering the illusion. Okay, now you could also ask, why might this not work? Uh, so sorry, the text is a little cut off on the slide, but it says, when might this not work? Take a second to think about it. When might this recipe not be an effective way to do transfer? So this approach to transfer may be ineffective if the correct way to act in the target domain is simply unavailable to you in the source domain. So this will force you to avoid doing things in the source domain that you can't do in the target domain, but if it's vice versa, if the wall is present in the source domain, then there's kind of no way to avoid it because you can't do impossible things in the source domain. So then you might end up with a highly suboptimal uh, or even 
completely failed policy in the target domain if the source domain just doesn't provide you with the opportunities to do the things that are needed to succeed in the target domain. And of course we know that in general this is an unsolvable problem, going back to that example with breakout versus algorithmic trading. Okay, now the last bit that I'm going to discuss in this portion of the lecture is uh, what if we can also fine-tune? So, so far, all the domain adaptation techniques I talked about, they're not really related to fine-tuning. They, they mostly deal with zero-shot generalization, but under the assumption that there's access to some amount of data from a target domain. But if we get to also fine-tune, of course, uh, a lot of these issues will be alleviated. However, there are a number of problems with fine-tuning in RL, which make it not quite as straightforward as in supervised learning problems. One problem is that in RL, tasks are generally quite a bit less diverse. So in uh, computer vision, for example, you might pre-train on some really broad and complex domain like ImageNet, and then fine-tune on, let's say, fine-grain classification. But in RL, uh, you might pre-train on like getting the AMP to run, and that task is perhaps not diverse enough to be suitable for pre-training for getting the AMP to also jump. So the features that you get are less general, and the policies and value functions can become overly specialized. The second issue is that optimal policies and fully observed MDPs are deterministic. Said precisely, the statement is that if you have a fully observed MDP, there exists an optimal policy that is deterministic. But in practice, many algorithms will actually find that deterministic policy. And if after pre-training you are left with a deterministic policy, and you go to try to fine-tune the deterministic policy in a new MDP, you might just not make any learning progress because that policy is just not exploring very much. So uh, less of exploration and convergence and low entry policies adapt very slowly to new settings. It turns out that we can actually address both of these issues to a degree by utilizing the controls inference or maxent RL ideas that we discussed in, in, in our previous lecture. So if you can fine-tune with maximum entropy policies, then you can maintain the ability to, uh, sorry, if you can pre-train with maximum entropy policies, then you can maintain the ability to explore when you fine-tune. So how can you uh, increase diversity and entropy? Well, utilize the controls inference framework, which as we saw, leads to the objective of maximizing reward and also additionally maximizing entropy. So that means essentially act as randomly as possible while collecting high rewards. So I already showed this example uh, in the controls inference lecture, but I'll show it again because I think it illustrates this point pretty, pretty nicely. Um, and I'll, I'll discuss it in a little more detail. So uh, let's say that you need to reach this blue cross. If you end up with a deterministic policy, that policy really only knows how to do the task in one way. So that when the task changes at test time, maybe a wall blocks that path. Now you essentially have to unlearn how to walk into the upper passage and relearn how to walk into the lower passage. However, if you train with maximum entropy reinforcement learning, you might discover both paths. And then when one of the paths is made impossible, the other paths will, will still be there. So all you have to do is just select one of the modes that you've already learned, which is a much easier problem. So if you learn to solve the task in all possible ways, you get much more robust transfer. Uh, so here's an example, which I already showed before with the uh, explosion of spiders. So, uh, on the left, you can see a, a deterministic algorithm. This is DDPG. On the right is a maximum entropy RL algorithm called soft Q learning. And in both cases, the reward function is simply to run as fast as possible, regardless of the direction. So when provided with this kind of unguided reward function, the maximum entropy RL algorithm, of course, learns to run in many different directions, whereas the deterministic algorithm simply selects one direction arbitrarily. And then for fine tuning, we put both algorithms, as well as the random baseline, into a hallway where the goal is really to learn how to run in one particular direction. And the problem here now is that the deterministic algorithm has to essentially unlearn how to run in the wrong direction and relearn how to run in the right direction, whereas the maximum entropy algorithm just has to figure out which among the different directions that it has already learned is the right one. And as a result, it can learn much, much faster. And of course, we see this quantitatively. So here, the blue line shows the maximum entropy solution the green line shows the deterministic solution, and the orange line shows what happens when you just train from scratch. And these are all fine-tuning learning curves. All right, so if you want to learn more about the domain adaptation material, the first material that I covered, here are some papers I recommend. 
So deep domain confusion and domain adversarial neural networks. These are uh, two classic papers introducing uh, the adversarial method for enforcing invariance in computer vision. Uh, this is the paper I discussed that extends us to RL. And this is the paper that I discussed uh, that uh, has the Truman Show trick that uh, where, you, where you don't shatter the illusion by avoiding actions in the source domain that are impossible in the target domain. But there are, of course, many others, and this is not by any means a complete uh, uh, kind of survey. If you want to learn more about fine-tuning, here are a few recommendations. This is the paper that I talked about. Uh, Andreas et al. has a nice discussion of fine-tuning in the paper on modular policy sketches. Uh, Florenza et al. has a nice discussion of this with stochastic neural networks. Um, and there's actually a more recent paper by Kumar et al., uh, which formalized this notion of robustness. So it talks about how if you can learn many different solutions, then you can be robust in the, force, in, in the face of various perturbations and changes to the task in a formal sense. And again, there are many others. This is by no means a complete survey, but if you're interested in this topic, maybe these papers will help you get started.